All right, so we begin this morning with news concerns, new concerns rather, over the crisis in Ukraine. The Pentagon says Russia has moved more combat forces to the borders in the last 24 hours, further escalating fears of an invasion. That includes new live fire drills along the Ukrainian border and more jets in Eastern Europe. Russian troops are also conducting naval exercises in the Baltic Sea. The Pentagon is watching these growing numbers closely. We continue to see, uh, including in the last 24 hours, uh, con uh, more accumulation of, of credible combat uh, forces uh, arrayed by the Russians uh, in, again, the western part of their country and in, uh, and in Belarus. The U.S. is now calling for a meeting next week with the U.N. Security Council to discuss the standoff in Ukraine. All of this coming just a day after the Kremlin said it's not optimistic there will be any diplomatic resolution. After the U.S. said in a written response it would not ban Ukraine from joining NATO. President Biden spoke with Ukrainian President Zelensky on the phone yesterday reaffirming U.S. support. Ukraine's leader says the biggest needs right now besides any peaceful de-escalation efforts are military and financial assistance. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley is on the ground in Kiev, Ukraine, and NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman joins us from Washington. Matt, let's start with you. NBC News has learned that Russia has increased its number of battalion tactical groups near the border of Ukraine to 62. That's up from 59 last week with more on the way. So how is Ukraine responding now to this new movement? I mean, guys, uh, you know, the sort of mystifying, unsatisfying answer to that question is they don't really seem to be responding. And that's because the official position still from this government is that Russia still might not invade, despite the massive accumulation of troops marshalling on the north, east and south of the country with an overwhelming military force. In fact, just this morning, I spoke with the U.S. charge d'affaires here. She's the most senior diplomat, almost like an ambassador, an Acting ambassador here. And here's what she had to say about the Ukrainian government's sort of bizarrely cavalier attitude. Ukraine has been facing Russian aggression for decades. And since uh, 2014, they've been facing it uh, literally. I mean, fighting in the East, Ukrainians die every day. And so I think Ukrainians are just a bit used to Russian aggression. And so perhaps. Uh, you know, don't show the sort of alarm that one would think. And, and I would argue that's a good thing. I mean, you, you want the Ukrainians to address this in a reasoned, uh, you know, uh, uh, calm manner, and that's what they're doing. So just as she said, you know, there's already been all this fighting in the Donbass region. So one reason why we're not seeing a lot of movements is because most of the military assets that Ukraine has are already on the front lines fighting against these Russian-backed separatists in the Donbass region. Another reason is because any troop movement by the Ukrainians could be seen as a pretext for an invasion by the Russians, because they have just been looking for any reason to show that it's the West or the Ukrainians who are the aggressors, and that would give them a casus belli, a pretext to invade. Guys? So, Josh, we know President Biden spoke with Ukraine's president yesterday. What happened on that call? What kind of support is the U.S. pledging? Yeah, Joe, as the U.S. waits a formal response from Russia to that written document submitted to the Russian government uh, in the last few days, President Biden speaking by phone with Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, for a phone conversation that the White House says uh, was focused on coordinating diplomatic efforts to reaffirm U.S. support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, the president saying in a tweet that the U.S. will respond decisively with its allies if Russia further invades Ukraine. But, you know, I I thought it was really telling what happened just in the wake of this phone call. Uh, Joe, there was some reporting from another news organization that suggested that President Biden had been fairly alarmist on that phone call, uh, saying that an uh, invasion was almost certain and that uh, Ukraine should brace for impact. The speed and vehemence with which the U.S. batted down that report, going on the record to say it's nonsense, and then the Ukrainians, too, trying to say, don't listen to anonymously 
sourced reports from, you know, unnamed officials, listen to what these governments are putting out officially, speaks to how concerned both countries are right now about the image of this and the perception uh, that, you know, Russia could exploit the perception uh, that this is, you know, a fait accompli, that these countries are really running scared, particularly as the U.S. has withdrawn the family members of many of its diplomats, encouraged Americans to leave. Yet still, you know, there is an alarming buildup we're seeing. Here's what Jen Psaki, the White House spokeswoman, had to say about that. More than 100,000 troops are building up at the border. Uh, there are military exercises around in other countries. The Ukrainians have been welcoming our security assistance uh, and even meeting us at the airport to welcome it and asking for more. Okay. So what we're doing right now is planning for all scenarios. So what the U.S. is providing now are these tranches of aid, including some uh, lethal weaponry, such as those Javelin anti-tank missiles. Uh, but what they're not providing and still have taken off the table is U.S. ground tr troops uh, in the Ukraine, which obviously would be uh, such a game changer, Joe. So, Matt, what are the options right now for President Putin? What is it that we, he might be weighing as he decides his next move? That's a tough one. That's the million-dollar question, Joe. And, I mean, the fact is, the first big option is, of course, not to invade. He could just withdraw his troops and go back to normal. That would be a risky move for him domestically in terms of his perception among the Russian people, because then what does he look like? He looks like someone who was an aggressor, but also someone who was weak, who decided not to go through with it. So, really, what he needs is some sort of some sort of concession from the West in order to do that. He needs to be able to return to the Russian public and say, look what I got for you guys. Uh, whether or not that happens, if that happens through negotiations, it's unclear that he's going to get something like that, guys. All right, Matt and Josh, thank you so much for kicking us off this hour. We appreciate it. This morning, Senate Democrats are eager to begin the confirmation process to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. During Breyer's retirement announcement Thursday, President Joe Biden repeated his campaign promise to nominate the first black woman to the high court. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. It's long overdue. Here to help us break down what comes next is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell. Leanne, good morning. We're so glad to have you with us. Talk to me about the timeline here. Democrats are saying they want to move quickly on this nomination. Why are they in such a rush? Good morning, Ellison. Well, Democrats want to vote as quickly as possible as soon as they have the vote. Of course, we have to wait for the nomination and the hearings have to take place. These senators are also going to want to meet with this Supreme Court justice nominee as well. But the reason is because the Democrats have such a slim majority and anything can happen. There can be the health of a member could go bad. Someone, unfortunately, could die. Uh, someone could change parties. You have no idea what's going to happen, and Democrats know they have this slim majority, and so they want to waste no time and move forward. But ultimately, it's going to be up to the members of how fast this goes, because if members need more time to study this person's background or have more questions, that could slow the process down. But historically, it usually takes about two and a half months to get this done. The last Supreme Court justice nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, it was just 27 days. So speed is possible, Ellison. When you look at that list you had up of the potential contenders at the very top of that list as someone who was previously confirmed with bipartisan support when she appeared before the Senate in the past, I think you had three Republican senators, senators who approved her nomination. Is there a chance we could see bipartisan support for a nominee in this situation, given that Democrats do have a majority? I think there is. Someone like Senator Susan Collins is someone who you likes to vote for the president's nominee. She did not vote for Amy Coney Barrett because she didn't like how close it was to the 2020 presidential election. Also, she voted for Judge Jackson in the lower court nomination or confirmation. So did Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. And so did Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. So we are watching those three. And plus, there could be a couple more who do vote for this. Of course, it depends on the nominee. We'll see who's nominated. We'll see what, if anything, comes up in their background. But at this point, Democrats think that they could perhaps get at least one or two Republicans, Ellison. 
Supreme Court has been an incredibly political issue of late. We heard it talk about in the presidential election, midterms prior to that. How do you think this will impact the midterms? So this could very well be good for Democrats. Uh, they just had a huge defeat on voting rights legislation, something that has really infuriated and frustrated, especially black voters. And the fact that Biden says that he's going to nominate a, the first black woman to the Supreme Court could be a huge energizing factor for that portion of the party, as well as the progressive activists as well, who has been wanting a new uh, a progressive person nominated to the court. We'll see who this is, of course. As for Republicans, they are going to see how motivated this gets their base. They have said, look, elections have consequences. That's why Democrats are able to uh, fill the Supreme Court seat. And so they are going to use that to the polls in order to get their people to vote, um, because we know the Supreme Court, especially for conservatives, is a huge issue, Allison. Yeah, thank you so much, Leanne. We appreciate your reporting. Yeah. N95 masks are on their way to pharmacies and health centers across the country, and millions of Americans are starting to receive those free at-home testing kits. It's all part of the federal government's ramped-up distribution plan to try and protect Americans from the Omicron variant. More than 400 million masks will be delivered through the program, making it the biggest distribution effort of PPE in U.S. history. The shipments come as hospitalization numbers reach new highs in some parts of the country. NBC News correspondent Heidi Presbella is outside a community health center in Washington, a place set to receive those masks. So, Heidi, good morning. So walk us through what we can expect to see next from this rollout. Yeah, good morning, Joe. I'm here in D.C. because D.C. right now has the highest hospitalization rate per capita in the nation. And I'm here in Ward 5 where they've seen some of the highest numbers of deaths, Joe. And so what they're hoping is that people will show up at these community centers, which have been prioritized by the Biden administration to receive the PPE, because this aspect of COVID, Joe, doesn't get enough attention. And that is that a lot of the people who are getting really sick and dying, it's not about ideology. It's about access. It's about access to things that can protect them, like the N95 masks and the tests. A lot of the people here maybe can't afford them to go in and work their shift at Starbucks. And maybe then they come home in a crowded setting where they give the virus to Grandma Joe. So they're hoping that by prioritizing these places like the community centers, people will get the word and come out and get the things, get the tools that can protect them. So, Heidi, I know you recently spoke to Dr. Cameron Webb, the equity director for the White House. COVID response team. So what did he have to say about how different communities are being prioritized for this rollout? Yeah, well, first he said they've learned some lessons from website rollouts because we've seen a very seamless rollout here of this website. And in part, what they did was they piloted it, and this hasn't been reported before, but they piloted this with these underserved communities. So they took these zip codes, they're called socially vulnerable index. It's a CDC measurement that they use to identify underserved communities that might need additional assistance. And they prioritize those by partnering with faith-based and other community organizations. Take a listen to what he said, Joe. These are the same zip codes that have faced an increased burden of COVID, more hospitalizations, more deaths, and then a lot of the other dynamics that lead to, to worse outcomes with COVID, whether it's rates of chronic disease or even risks of exposure. And so making sure that we're, we're putting that priority there and saying that we, we care deeply about your access to resources. So the results, Joe, are that so far the administration tells me that 43 percent of the millions of tests that have been mailed out have gone to underserved communities. And going forward, USPS is now putting aside 20 percent of the tests in reserve to make sure that they continue to go to those high priority zip codes, Joe. Interesting to hear that. So we're still dealing with Omicron. That's the priority right now. But what did Dr. Webb say about the potential for another wave of COVID? COVID infections in the future. How's the government preparing for that? Yeah, look, this is, as you said, the largest deployment of PPE in history, and yet the idea that I got from him is that we are just ramping up, right? The government was putting out about 100 million tests back in November. This particular shipment is 500 million. Joe Biden, the president, has already called for another 500 million. And you can expect to see more of this with vaccination rates so low. That is the idea that I got from him. Here's what he said. 
our hope is that when you couple this with our work around masking, with our work around really talking to folks about the key mitigation strategies and then around the vaccination effort, you know, over time we have more and more community immunity. We have fewer folks who are susceptible to these kind of outbreaks. This is how we make progress in the pandemic. So again, the idea, Joe, is Again, Joe, the idea is that facilities like this aren't just putting out a one-time mask uh, giveaway here, that this could be really a permanent infrastructure to handle additional surges, additional variants. Joe? I think that's a lesson we're learning from Omicron. We have to prepare for more in the future. Heidi Prisbella, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Let's bring in NBC News senior medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres, for more on the latest COVID news. Dr. Torres, it's wonderful to have you here because there is always a new study, something to talk about. And we have a new one today from the CDC, uh, a report from them suggesting that a third COVID vaccine for people with weakened immune systems is very effective. According to this study, Pfizer and Moderna shots work to prevent hospitalizations in immunocompromised people about 88% of the time. Looking at this study, what do you make of it? How does it further our understanding of COVID vaccines? And big picture, what does this mean for those of us who have stronger immune systems? And Ellison, this is great news because what this is showing us is the vaccine is working the way we want it to work, and that's preventing hospitalizations, preventing that serious illness, and even more importantly, preventing deaths. And we found out with immunocompromised, who we know need extra doses, we don't call it a booster, we call it a third dose, and now even a fourth dose, that that third dose is really, really effective. And like you mentioned, with that third dose, it's proving to be 88% effective in real-world studies at keeping immunocompromised out of the hospital. If they did not get the third dose, they only got the first two doses, 69% effective. So you can see how much that bumps up. What that also means is they looked at those who were not immunocompromised, those with healthy immune systems, and they found out that with just the regular dosing, the two vaccines, and remember, this is in the Omicron era, 60 or 82% effective at keeping you from being hospitalized. But once you got that third dose, that booster shot, 97% Ellison from keeping from being hospitalized. So like I tell people, if you get sniffles, if you get a little bit of COVID and it passes and you're doing fine, that vaccine is doing what we want it to do is keeping you out of the hospital and more importantly, keeping you from dying, Ellison. Yeah, and Moderna, uh, they are shifting gears, it seems here. They have begun early stage clinical trials of an HIV mRNA vaccine. That's the same technology that's used in two of the three COVID vaccines approved here in the U.S. Pfizer and Moderna both use that technology. Break down for us what this means. Obviously, Moderna is doing a lot of work on the COVID front as well, but has COVID in some ways opened up the door for more medical advancements, even though to a lot of us it feels like we're stuck in a never-ending cycle of bad news when it comes to health. And Ellison, it can feel like that because that's all we get are the bad news. But this is fantastic. About a year ago, I talked to one of the researchers that started developing mRNA vaccines over the last couple of decades. And what she told me was this is very exciting because of all the effort, all the manpower and money that's been put into research for a COVID vaccine is really jump starting the mRNA vaccines for a lot of other things, including HIV research. And that's what we're seeing here, the fruits of that labor. And so Moderna, like you mentioned, is starting this trial here, which an H with an HIV vaccine that uses mRNA technology, they're going to give people the shots, the booster shots, and try and find out whether that prevents them from getting HIV, which is the goal here that's been unattainable for decades, Allison. Mm, it's amazing stuff. We also have, before we let you go, a question from one of our viewers. Sydney Gaddis asked this. She said, we just got our kids the first vaccine shot on Friday. On Monday, they tested positive for COVID. When should we get them the second shot, the normal three weeks, or do we wait 90 days since they already got COVID? So if it's the second shot, you want to make sure you get it at that three-week interval, even though they had COVID, as long as they recover from the COVID, because getting those first two shots is important to getting that immune system high. Now, as far as getting the booster shot, the experts are saying you can wait a little bit, maybe a month, maybe up to three months after recovering from COVID, unless you're immunocompromised or around somebody who's immunocompromised. And then in that case, you want to go ahead and get it. But for the primary series, those first two vaccines, you want to make sure you get them as scheduled, because that gets your immune system to that level it needs to be in order to keep you or hopefully prevent you from that hospitalizations we talked about and serious illness, Ellison. All right, Dr. John Torres, thank you so much.
Now, if you have a question for one of our doctors, let us know. They are ready to answer any of your questions. Email us at morningnewsnow at NBCUNI.com. You can also let us know if you want to stay anonymous. Millions in the Northeast are bracing for what could be a record-breaking winter storm heading their way this weekend. Some places could potentially see up to two feet of snow. So, of course, we send NBC News correspondent Kathy Park into the heart of it. She joins us now from the Massachusetts coastline south of Boston with more on what to expect. So, Kathy, what are they expecting where you are right now? Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Well, New England is bracing for a significant winter storm. So we are talking about high snow totals anywhere from a foot to two feet of snow. Snowfall rates could be anywhere between two to four inches of snow tomorrow. And then uh, storm surge is also a concern in these coastal communities. So beach erosion, flooding also top of mind. And then you have the high wind gusts, wind gusts. So widespread power outages also a big concern in this area. So today, as you know, uh, is kind of the day to prepare. Things are relatively calm. So that is what emergency responders are telling folks now use this day to get ready. Joe? Yeah, I see all that salt behind you. So what are cities, towns doing to get ready for what's coming their way? Yeah, so you know what? Today they are saying go out and, and stock up on the essentials if you can actually find it, right? Here in Situate, um, as you mentioned, you referenced this big uh, salt dome behind me, more than a thousand tons of salt uh, ready to get going during the storm. But I was told yesterday and also today they have been pre treating the roadways with brine, um, but it's kind of all hands on deck here and across New England. Take a listen. We don't have enough trucks. We got 220 plus miles of road in town and we just, you know, the capital behind it. We, so we hire outside contractors. They bring their own truck, they bring their own loader, they bring their own driver, and they're paid the appropriate rate. We're getting prepared. We are now for to cover the 1,200 miles of road here in the town of Hempstead. We are getting the plows on the trucks. We're putting the salt on the back. We are gassing them up. And Joe, this really is uh, the calm before the storm, uh, really the, the beginning stages. So um, I was told people will be preparing um, behind the scenes. It really is all hands on deck. We're supposed to hear um, th from the mayor of Boston later on today to get a better sense of their emergency response. So I'm sure there are a lot of press conferences that we'll be monitoring throughout the day today, Joe. And quickly, Kathy, I mean, are people excited? Are they anxious? How are they feeling? You know what? It kind of depends on, on who you ask. Um, when it comes to the kids, they love a snow day, right? Uh, but New Englanders, they're, they're pretty hardy. They know the drill. But this year, it's a little unique because I'm hearing a lot about staffing issues. Obviously, COVID is still a big headline here. And then also uh, dealing with shipping delays as folks stock up on the essentials. Take a listen. The kids are excited. They're going to get outside and get to shovel, play in the driveway a little bit, and hopefully do some sledding. So hopefully we get a, a decent amount of snow, just uh, just not too much. There's a nor'easter coming, and my husband likes the um, ice melt that has magnesium chlorides. Ever since, uh, what, Monday, I think it was announced, people have been coming in for a lot more salts and shovels. As far as uh, supply chain issues, it, it's just another day in business. We. 2015, we never ran out of anything. It's the same thing. You've got to know where to get it. You can't find plastic. Plastic comes from somewhere. And once again, the consensus um, from emergency officials, they're saying do the, the prep work now. Um, if you need to bring things indoors, do it because we're going to be dealing with extreme wind gusts in the area as well. But today is the, the day to prepare because they do not want folks out on the roadways tomorrow, Joe. Kids excited to shovel. We'll see how long that lasts. All right, Kathy Park, thank you so much. With that, let's get a check on your morning news now weather. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now with the latest forecast and what to expect this weekend. Bill, good morning. Uh, do we know what Kathy did wrong? Do we know why she got this uh, assignment? <laughs> she just, she's eager. She does Poor a good Kathy. job. <laughs> <laughs> she's eager. You, you could always be eager to cover your first blizzard. And then after exactly. that, you're right. like, yep, I'm yeah, done. Right. That's, that's good. Go. Yeah. Blizzard's probably worse. Experience. Yeah, Experience. Blizzard's one of the worst assignments because it, it's, it's cold and it's just snow all behind you. You really can't see anything. And you're just like, you won't even be able to measure it because it's blowing all over the place. So good luck, Kathy. Uh, we've all been there before. Uh, <laughs> All right, so let's get into this forecast. What changed overnight? We've been talking about the computer models the last couple of days. Do they disagree? Do they agree? 
Now they're in better agreement. The forecast confidence has increased for the snow amounts, and that usually happens 36 to 24 hours before the event. And the big thing that happened overnight was our American computer model, which had been a little more off the coast with lower snow totals, has shifted towards the coast closer to the European model. Doesn't always happen this way. Uh, frequently it does, though. The European model is a little more reliable. It has a better what we call verification score. Uh, and you can see those little L's. That's where the storm center is. The ones to the right were yesterday. The ones overnight are the ones bottom left. So closer to the coast. And that means we've increased the snow forecast, especially New York City, the Jersey Shore to Philadelphia. A uh, higher um, confidence that you will get a warning criteria snowfall, which is usually about six to seven inches or more. And you notice that now the American model almost completely agrees with where the heavy snow is going to be on the European model. So let's get to the forecast now. Stop talking about the models. Here is the number of people impacted, 65 million people. I-95 corridor from D.C. northwards. Blizzard warnings are up for the first time in four years for the Boston area, Cape Cod, Jersey Shore, also Maryland and Delaware coastlines. And as far as the nor'easter impacts, the highest snow totals, that's possibility of 18 inches of snow for a huge section of eastern New England. Whiteout conditions stay off the roads on Saturday. We do not want drivers getting stranded on the highways. And there's the updated snow totals, guys. Uh, not a huge event for D.C., Baltimore, Philly. That's enough to cause you some problems. In New York City, now up to 8 to 12 inches, but of course, the really high stuff is found from Boston, Providence, Long Island. Someone will get between 2 to 3 feet from this storm, uh, but as I said, it'll be hard to measure. It'll be so windy. Wow. All right, Kathy, get ready. All right, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.